Hello class, glad to have you back again. We are beginning to look now at the letters in the New Testament, starting with the letters of Paul, the apostle. And the first of those letters that we're going to look at is the letter to the church at Rome, known as the book of Romans to us. We're going to talk for just a moment about author, date, provenance, and the occasion for the letter. The author is Paul. Uh, not only does the letter say that, but scholarship is generally agreed that it is Paul. This is really not a disputed issue. What we need to know is who is Paul? Who is this man? Paul had a huge influence on the development of early Christianity. Uh, numerous New Testament books, large and small, were written by him, and virtually half of the book of Acts deals with his life. So who is this Paul? Well, Paul is known in the New Testament also as Saul of Tarsus. He was a one-time Pharisee and a persecutor, a fierce persecutor of the church, as we saw in the book of Acts. He was converted while on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. Paul was a Roman citizen, and it is believed uh, that Saul, by which name he is also known in the New Testament was his Hebrew name, while Paul was his Roman name. Now, when was this book written? Sometimes, certainly in the mid-50s. Dates range from anywhere from 54 to 57. Anywhere in that time span works. It's related to his time in Corinth and to the dating of certain public officials in the city of Corinth that relate to Paul's time there. Some sources will say 54, some will say 57, somewhere in that time span. It was written in Corinth, probably, possibly in Sincrea, but most likely from the city of Corinth. What is the occasion? Why is Paul writing to the Romans? He's never been to Rome. He really doesn't know a lot of believers in Rome, though we find at the end of the book he knows a few. He has no prior connection to this church, really. Why is he writing to Rome? Well, two things are in, in motion here. One, he's got a trip coming up to Jerusalem to deliver financial aid for those suffering from a famine there. So that's in the works. But then once he's done with that trip, his plan is to go to Spain by way of Rome. What he really wants is for Rome to be his forward staging base uh, in the West, much like Antioch has been in the East. So, Paul wants to build a relationship with Rome. He wants them to know what he's preaching. He wants them to support his preaching. And he wants to come and spend time with them, get to know them, and gain their support for his further missionary work in Spain. Because he wants to preach the gospel where the gospel has not been preached. And in order to do that now, what he sees as his best option is to head further west into Europe. So he's planning to go to Spain, and he wants Rome to support him. So that's the, the author, that's the date, that's the province, that's the occasion of the book. Secondly, we want to look at theological themes. What are the theological themes that Paul addresses in the book of Romans? Well, Romans is, in many respects, the nearest we get to a full-blown systematic theology in the New Testament. Paul is writing an extensive work to a church that doesn't know him by face in order to introduce himself. It is a letter of introduction, and he wants them to know what he stands for, what he believes, what he teaches and preaches. And so we have a number of themes here. We actually have seven theological themes. The first is that the gospel is embodied in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in his life, his death, his resurrection, all of that together is the gospel. Secondly, why do we need a gospel? Why do we need good news? This raises the question of sin, the sinfulness of the Gentiles, the sinfulness of the Jews. Paul is going to spend uh, much of chapter 1, all of chapter 2, and a big portion of chapter 3 dealing with the problem of sin to conclude that all, whether they've heard the law of God or not, are in fact uh they are all guilty, and they all stand in need of God's grace. So uh, this is a second theological theme. Uh, 
And so we have that. Now we also have, as a theological theme, uh, the problem, the issue of God's righteousness. God's righteousness. So, how is God righteous and able to justify guilty sinners? That becomes an issue. How can God be just and the justifier of sinners? So Paul's going to spend a great deal of time talking about the righteousness of God. And even in chapter 1, he introduces the idea that in the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. Then he's going to talk about justification by faith. What does that mean? What does that look like? How does that impact our lives and the way we live? And that then bleeds over into a discussion of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and how the Holy Spirit impacts who we are as new creations in Christ. We also have then the issue of God's sovereignty and human responsibility as especially as it relates to Israel's current state of unbelief in Paul's day. How is it that God is faithful to his covenant promises and Israel is bound up in this unbelief and its rejection of Jesus as Messiah? And this is, Paul argues, part of God's sovereign plan for the salvation of the Gentiles. And uh, and so Paul is dealing with this issue of sovereignty and human responsibility. And in chapter 9, the sovereignty of God plays a very prominent role. But in chapter 10, the responsibility of sinners to respond to the gospel and of Christians to spread the gospel plays a very prominent role. So uh, Paul is trying to balance these two very difficult questions. And then beginning in chapter 12, he picks up with the Christian life. How should all of this that we have looked at up to this point impact how people live as Christians? What does that look like? How does that translate into everyday life? And so that is the theological themes uh, of the book of Romans. I want to begin now with a reading of the text from Romans. Paul really lays out the heart of the book and the message of the book in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So that is the theme of the book of Romans, is salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ. This is how we are made righteous, and Christ himself is the sum and substance of the gospel. Now, what we're going to do next uh, in this video, we're going to begin to look at the general outline of the book of Romans. We'll go for a few more minutes with this, and then we'll start another video uh, lecture on the rest of the book of Romans. So let's look quickly at an outline of the book of Romans. First of all, chapter 1, the gospel as the revelation of God's righteousness. Paul begins chapter 1 with a greeting. It's very similar to typical Roman and Greek greetings and letters from this time period, but Paul has adapted it with certain Christian vocabulary. He's replaced some ideas and some words that would normally be used there in a pagan sense with some Christian words. And he gives a, a statement of thanksgiving for the Roman believers and talks about how he prays for them. And then he introduces his theme, the gospel of God's righteousness given to us in Christ and how God is righteous in doing that. So that is the central theme of the book. Then in chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, he introduces us to God's righteousness in his wrath against sinners. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against sinners, Paul says. And he goes through, spends the rest of chapter 1 developing what that looks like. And the focus of it really is the issue of idolatry. The issue of idolatry is something that provokes God's ultimate wrath. And so Paul will argue throughout this portion of the book that because pagan nations, seeing the glory of God in creation, having uh, 
conscience because they're in the image of God and have a certain innate knowledge of right and wrong combined with what they know from general revelation from the world around them rather than worshiping the true God and giving him thanks because of their sinful depravity. Instead, what they do is they turn that into idolatry and they worship created things rather than the creature. Therefore, as a further punishment for their idolatry, God gives them over to other sins as a form of punishment. And those sins, Paul focuses on those sins early on on the issue of sexual sins, degrading one's self sexually. At first, he's talking about immorality in a very general sense of sexual promiscuity. Uh, in this light would be things like adultery and fornication, living together out of wedlock, these kinds of things where there's no commitment, where people trip, simply treat the sex act uh, as if they were animals and simply satisfying their, their baser pleasures, and that's degrading in itself because we are created male and female in the image of God and not meant to degrade that. And then he moves from there to the discussion of the specific issue of homosexual sin as, as a sign of God's judgment on people, that God gives them over to the further degrading of their bodies, either in acts of male homosexuality or female, what we would call lesbian homosexuality. And this is, uh, Paul considers this to be the ultimate degradation of self. It is the ultimate rejection of God's design for man and woman, because we are designed biologically to be different but compatible for the purpose of procreation. And the homosexual act is incapable of that. And so Paul sees this as the ultimate uh, degradation of the human condition. Paul talks about God giving them over three times. Paul says God gave them over. And the third time he says God gave them over to a depraved mind, to a mind uh, incapable really of appreciating right and wrong. Not that they don't know right and wrong, but they are unable to act on what they know as right and wrong. They willfully, joyfully choose that which is wrong. And then he gives a long vice list and concludes it with the, the sharp warning that uh, not they're, they're so bad off that not only do they do these things, but they encourage others to join with them in it. And it is that encouraging endorsing of this sinful behavior that is truly, truly horrendous. They, they not only want to, uh, to deal with sin themselves, they want to bring as many people along with them as they can. And all of this is symptomatic of God having given them over in an act of judgment to their, uh, to their sins for their own uh, future judgment and destruction. Now, Paul leaves off with the Gentiles there and begins in chapter 2 to talk about the unrighteousness of the Jews. And he goes into great detail there, showing that the Jews are no better. Even though they have the law and they know explicitly the revealed will of God, they are guilty of the very same things. And so they're no different. They're no better. They're equally guilty. All stand in need of God's grace. This is Paul's point. He wants to make the point that everyone is in need of God's grace and no one is exempt. And so in chapter 3, he starts really pressing the case for universal depravity and the universal need of salvation. And in chapter 3, he quotes numerous passages from various psalms in this regard. And it's interesting, the all-encompassing nature of Paul's sweeping condemnation that he makes in chapter 3. Listen to some of the things that he says here. Beginning in... Uh, Beginning in verse 10, well, I'm going to start in verse 9. Paul says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? Not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. And now he begins quoting from Psalms, from various Psalms. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. 
The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so Paul brings a sweeping condemnation on all of humanity. Everyone is unrighteous and stands in need of God's salvation. We're going to stop there. We'll pick up with that in the next lecture video with the saving righteousness of God.